I know it's a guy thing mostly, but if you're a fan of the, the Godfather trilogy, you surely f know the famous quote from its third installment, when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Hmm? Well, lately, during the last few weeks, I tried. I really try. I really try to focus on something else. I try to avoid the subject. And just when I thought I'd and move on, it came back in the media. <sighs> Donald Trump, Russia, act email servers, uh, leak classified reports. And I'm not even touching with the 10-foot pole some of the allegation that we have heard this week. We might debate for days why some people have, uh, have a sick fascination about the whole situation and if we should listen to him or not. The fact remains that in just a few days, he will be the President of the United States of America, which is our neighbor and our main commercial partner. And I really feel compassion for those who will have to nav navigate this chaotic time. Those who will have to deal with this apparently dysfunctional administration for four years. Speaking of dysfunctional, the lectionary offer us this morning the beginning of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And you might know that the Roman Catholic Church has patron saints for different uh, groups or professions. Well, if they would be a patron saint for highly dysfunctional uh, congregation, the church in Corinth would be the obvious choice. Uh, how to say it politely? The church was a mess. There's no other way to say it. It was a total mess. Conflict and division on almost every possible issue threatening to blow up this community of faith. They were arguing over matters of um, who, whom has the best leader, who had better morals, uh, whose worship was more accurate and more uh, meaningful, and who old, <coughs> sorry, who old the right belief about the resurrection of the death. In short, Everyone was feeling superior than their neighbors, and they want to prove to all they were better and they had all the answers. And thank God this tension and division has disappeared from our church these days. So, knowing this, we go to the beginnings of today's text, only to discover it's the very beginning of the letter to the Corinthians. And we might have noticed, you might have noticed that Paul started his numerous epistles with usual convention and classical formula of his time. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, blah, 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 to the church of God that is current, to those who are sanctifying in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace for God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, yada, yada, yada. Yes, usually we look at these verses and we're tempted to skip over them in order to go to the juicy part, the, part, the good parts, when the, we feel there's meat on it. Well, however, by doing so, we would miss important points. It's true that Paul follows similar patterns in his letters, but there's a significant difference in this one. You see, for example, in his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul says, we always give thanks to God for you, uh, 
and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and our Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you can read over and over today's text. You will not find prayers for the Corinthian or high, pra high praises for their work. No, no. It feels a little more like, okay, guys, you dug yourself in a hole, and it's time for you to figure it out a way, figure a way out of it by yourself because I'm not coming back to settle the issues and I'm not sending one of my associates to be your interim minister. So you broke the beautiful community I create, you better find a way to fix it. That's the way it feels. And yet, despite all of this, despite everything they have done, Paul has not given up on the Corinthian. He still cares for them and even offer them advice to improve their situation. First, Paul begins by reminding them that the church at Corinth is, yes, made up of ordinary people, but those people are called to be saints. And contrary to the belief of some, Paul does not understand sainthood as moral perfection or extraordinary faith. Saints are those who are called by God to be follower of Jesus the Christ. Saints are those who are set apart for God's work in the world, which should never be done alone or in isolation. Later in this letter, Paul notes that they are called not only to be out of the world, but also to work into the community where they're located. The saints in Corinth, like every like those of every places and time, have to work together for the sake of God's mission on earth. They are saints because they form a group, a communion of saints. And then Paul reassured the Corinthians by telling them they have everything they need to do what the church is supposed to do when it's supposed to be. In spite of their previous failures, the Christian and current are endowed with powerful spiritual gifts. In fact, they lack nothing. Some are blessed with eloquence, while others with understanding of every kind. They enrich in Christ and strengthen to live according to God's ways. There's so much potential within their midst that every voice in the community is valuable. Everyone is important. Everyone should be invited to contribute his or her unique gift, even the ones with whom they disagree. And as strange as it may sound, this message to the highly dysfunctional church in Corinth still applies to all of us. We might not be arguing or fighting on the regular, on the regular basis like the Corinthian did and on every topic imaginable, <coughs> sorry, but on some occasions, we forget our mission in this world. We struggle to live according to the call we receive. We are told that a minister will not renew our contract in just a few months. And after the initial shock, we sometimes think, oh my God, oh my God, what we will do, how we will function, who will lead us, who will solve our quarrels, who will teach us how to behave and, and to believe, who will save us. And as Paul reminded the Corinthians, we also need to remember that this is not our church, but the church of God in this part of the world. And our collective identity is not defined by a neighborhood, a denomination, or, or the ministerial staff, but our identity is defined in Christ Jesus. And the Holy One who has been faithful in the past and will continue to be faithful in the future is at the center of our community of faith. Our ability to be the church does not come from us, 
but from God continuous work among and in us. And for this reason, each and every one of us have been set apart to be saints, meaning to be followers of Jesus and everything we do, especially in challenging and uncertain times. And also, we should never forget the wisdom in the words we can read in the United Church latest statement of faith called Song of Faith. It says, to embody God's love in the world, the work of the church requires the ministry and discipleship of all believers. Not just those on the payroll, all believers like you. All of us have received gifts and abilities like the expression says, everybody is good at something. Some have the gift of understanding a complex situation in just a few seconds. Others are good at caring for those who struggle or speaking words that help, making signs, saying those who are tone deaf, <laughs> repairing a broken door, cooking meals for the brave, uh, keeping financial books, and so on and on and on. And those gifts are not ours to use for our sole benefit or for improvement of our total social status in our community, but for the various ministries of the Church of God, for the proclamation of the good news of Jesus the Christ, and for the building of a better world in which everybody will be valued and respected. Every one of us has something to contribute, and we are called to bring our gifts to our community, to make it better, to make it stronger, to make it even more faithful. Uh, today, like 2,000 years ago, it's not easy to belong to a congregation. Oh no, there's always something going on. When it's not a debate about the order of worship or the hymns we sing, it's squabble about how we spend our money or anxiety following the resignation of a minister. And on some days, we're just tempted to simply give up because it's too difficult, because those people are hopeless, or, or this church is a mess and we, it will never function properly. And just when we be believe we're done, that we are on a way out, will God find a way to pull us back in? by reminding us that this is God's church, that these people are our people. They are us. And we can make a difference in this world if we use all our gifts and we put, it, put them together. Despite all our flaws and all our failures, God has not given up on us. In good times, in challenging times, God always remind, always remain in our midst. And for this, thanks be to God and Amen.